Welcome back to the channel and thanks to the first timers. Today we're going to be building a keepsake box with brass feather splines and hardware. The body of the box is made from Goncalo Alves. The tray is made from reclaimed koa that I salvaged from some old speaker boxes that were given to me by my sister and brother-in-law. The speakers themselves were blown years ago, but it would be a shame to throw out the wood. I start by calculating what size I want my box fronts and sides to be and marking the lumber to rough length. Since the board is wider than my joiner, I removed the guard and joined as much face as I could. If you'd like to see the process on how to joint boards wider than your joiner bed, I went over that in detail in my basket weave cutting board video. Go check that out when we're done here. I'll link it in the video description. This board had been sitting for quite some time, so it had oxidized and darkened up quite a bit. It's always cool seeing what lies underneath. So the plan is to resaw this board so I'll have two pieces. One approximately a half inch and the other about an eighth of an inch after planing them down to final thickness. So here I'm roughly marking my sides and fronts. To try to keep the continuous grain consistent around the entire box, I try to eyeball where I want to cut so the final corner will wrap and be a close match to the first edge. These marks are more or less just a guesstimate. I'll use the stops on the sled to make my actual cuts. I stole the flip top from my incrementer gauge and put it on my sled for this step so I wouldn't have to fiddle with moving the stops back and forth. Just makes for less chance of error. After taking a look at the box, I thought it looked a little bit tall, so I decided to cut off a little bit of the height. I'll circle back to these cutoffs later. So I nibble away at 45 degrees until the blade just kisses the top side edge. I want to retain as much wood as possible so I don't screw up the continuity. Just make sure to use your stop block so your sides are the same length. I use this to set the blade height to cut grooves into the box sides to insert the floating top and bottom. So you can see here the grain looks pretty unbroken when I put the pieces back in line. So do yourself a favor and use painters tape to help align the miters. I used a combination square as a fence to help keep everything aligned as I put the tape on, but pushing against something fixed would be a lot easier. For the top and the bottom, I take inside to inside measurements of the box and write them down. I add 8 mils to those numbers to allow for a little bit of movement. Now that I have those numbers, I can cut the 1 8 inch piece that I'm using for the top and bottom. 
I'm going to cut this into three pieces because while the bottom will be a single piece, I'll be laminating the other two onto a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch for the top. This will give it some thickness and add some weight to the lid. I use tight bond 3 to laminate these pieces and a piece of tape to help keep it from sliding around. A little parchment paper goes a long way keeping things clean. Since I don't have a badass vacuum press system just yet, I just used the old gravity solution and flipped my portable moxin vise upside down to give it some even pressure. After letting it dry overnight, I cut some rabbits around the perimeter, nibbling away a little at a time until it fit into the grooves in the box sides. For your glue up, you're going to want to sand all interior faces of the box. I also sand both sides of the top and bottom since those are going to be slightly inset. So this step is optional, but I find cleanup is a lot easier if you mask off the inside of the box. You'll make up the time you invest here not having to reach into every corner with chisels and scrapers after everything dries. So for the glue up, I spread light layers of glue on all the mitered edges and just a touch in the center of the groove. I don't fill the entire groove with glue in case the top and bottom decide they want to move a little bit. Don't forget to check for square before walking away. Get it dialed in before the glue starts to set. If you wait too long, you're pretty well boned. After pulling the clamps off, now is where I circle back to those cutoffs from the box sides. I mitered the edges and glued them to the bottom of the box to give it a nice shadow line underneath. As you can clearly see here, I'm using a miter gauge set at 45 degrees to cut some 8 inch brass bar stock into triangles to use as feather splines. So unfortunately my camera died right before I cut the splines, but this is the jig I used. You can find build videos all over YouTube to make your own. I got inspiration for this one from King's Fine Woodworking. Check them out on YouTube. So your best bet to set splines into the wood would be 5 minute epoxy, but unfortunately I ran out of that, so I just mixed up some of this stuff. It's fine. When trimming off the excess brass, cut as close as you can to the wood to save yourself from having to sand forever. The metal's pretty rough on your sandpaper. So now it's time to remove the lid. 
To cut the lid off, I set the blade height so it's just shy of cutting all the way through the wood. I like to leave an onion skin on the inside so I don't have to worry about the top shifting on the final pass through the saw. To finish the job, I use a thin kerf saw to cut the remaining wood and separate the top from the body of the box. Some sandpaper on a flat surface will help clean things up. I also took a block plane and smoothed the edges off camera. So I measure the inside lip of the box and then I'll add about an eighth of an inch to that number. I'll cut some thin strips that will sit proud of the lid and act as a seal that will also keep the lid from slamming shut. I use a roundover tool to soften the edge to keep the trim from catching on the inside of the box. This just makes for smoother opening and closing. You can do the same thing with sandpaper, it's just a little more challenging to get consistent edges. With that out of the way, I can set the trim with CA glue and accelerator spray. Now that the bones of the box are complete, it's time to make the tray and tray support. I want the tray to sit halfway from the bottom of the box, so I measure the inside height and I cut strips of co at a size. I cut four pieces for the support and six more that I'll make into a tray with dividers. Because this koa wood is being salvaged, there were some brad nail holes I needed to fill. Instead of matching the wood, I decided to use a contrasting filler to highlight them and be a reminder of its past life. I used dark brown star bond and sanded it flush. It's subtle, but I like the story. Before installing the supports, I cut small chamfers into the top with a block plane. I know no one will ever really see it, but I like these little details.
because the bottom of the tray is only about a sixteenth of an inch, I really don't have any traditional tools to cut a groove that small. So we improvised and used a 1.6 millimeter end mill on the CNC. Since these pieces were resawn from just a few pieces of wood, I wanted to have the horizontal pieces all show the same grain pattern that will also run along the bottom of the tray. The vertical pieces will match each other as well. I didn't really know what I wanted the handle to look like going into this, so I found something small and round, just sketched some curves until I found a shape that I liked. Since I had already reinstalled my resaw blade, I was too lazy to change it out again, so I just nibbled away until I got close to the line. To join the interlocking dividers, I put them both into the tray and struck lines on either side of the piece of wood. Then I transferred that line to the other piece so I knew exactly where to cut. I set my blade height one half the height of the dividers and lined the blade up to one side of the line I transferred. I attached a thin piece of plywood to the back side with double sided tape to help stabilize and reduce tear out on the thin piece of wood. After making the cut, I flipped the piece around and cut the other direction. Using a miter gauge with a stop, this guaranteed the cutout would be dead center. After some sanding, the tray gets a little bit of Danish oil and paste wax. So the first step in finishing the box was a coat of shellac. I followed up this step with a coat of sanding sealer, mostly because I ran out of shellac. Once the sealer was dried and lightly sanded, I rubbed in my first coat of Aqua Coat Grain Filler. I applied this with a cotton rag in a circular motion to rub it into the grain and then removed the excess with the plastic putty knife against the grain to pack in as much as possible. Make sure to remove as much of the excess as you can before this stuff dries because it's nasty to clean up later. In order to mount these hinges flush, you need to remove just a little bit of material to allow them to open. I scored the wood about a sixteenth of an inch on both sides and removed material with a chisel.
I sprayed 10 coats of lacquer with very light sanding in between coats as needed. I used deft semi-gloss thinned about 10%. Once I installed the hinges, I decided the lid needed a light chamfer. I thought it broke up the solid front and gave the box a more interesting look. And that brings us to the end. Thanks again for making it this far. If you liked this build and you want to see more like it, hit those like and subscribe buttons to get notified when I post the next one. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.